Hey everybody, I'm JJ Johnson. You're watching Reality Survival. And today we are going to talk about bug out bags. Bug out bags and the top five bug out bag items that you would want to have in your bag. And this is part of the Prepper Trifecta. So Che from Prepper Logic and Eric from Lord Humongous should also be uh, uploading a video at this about the same subject at the same time. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that Che is not going to get it on time, but I might be wrong. We'll just have to see. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, you know, you'd think that this would be a fairly easy, um, an easy thing to do, like an easy um, thing to come up with. And it's not. It, it actually was not very easy at all. Um, because here's here's my problem is when I when I start thinking about these things, I go, <clears throat> OK, well, what would I want? And then I start to think, OK, well, you know, if I was dead for some reason or something, my wife would probably have different stuff. And then I start thinking about the guy who's just a weekend camper and into prepping and stuff like that. And he's got his bug out bag. But, you know, it, he would have a different level. And then I start thinking about, um, you know, the guy who's got the bug out location already predetermined, pre-stocked, ready to go. And his bug out bag is going to be even different because it's going to be super lightweight. So there's a lot of caveats to this, man. <laughs> there's a, hey, what's going on, guys? Um, I got a bunch of you guys in here already. Thanks for stopping by. Um, so, all right. When I, when I first, first, you know, kind of looked at this, I was like, all right, I want a fully loaded 4x4 crew cab with 200-gallon fuel tank mounted in the bed. And I also want a fully stocked 30 foot RV horse trailer with four horses and the tack in it, plus all my, you know, food supplies and ammo and everything else. I want a, a, a 500 watt energy apex solar generator kit, AR 10s for each person with full tactical kit and a thousand rounds of ammo per rifle and a year's worth of freeze dried food for each person. And then I was like, that's not really the intent of what this is. Hey, what's up, Urban Prepper 34? Um, <laughs> you know, the intent of this is to, sh to say to you guys, hey, what are the really important items, you know? And so that's what I'm going to try to get to. But you're going to have to bear with me a little bit because it, it just it, it just is not that easy. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see here. At the margarita. All right. Seriously, there are some some assumptions that are going to be make here that we're going to be making here um, before we get started. I am assuming that the person will have the proper clothing for the environment, and they will have all of their EDC level two gear. I have a video on EDC level two, but basically the EDC level two comes into play when there's a higher threat going on than your normal baseline, and so you're carrying a few extra options for self-defense, first aid, fire starting, you know, whatever the case may be. Okay. So you, if you want to go look at, at that video, you can. Um, also, I am not going to include water or food because the point of this video is to talk about gear, but just realize that each scenario, each person would likely have some food and water in their packs based on how much they could carry, where they're going, all that kind of stuff. Hey, what's up, Frank? So, <clears throat> So just to run down real quick on the EDC level two items, um, you know, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I'm a little bit sick. If you can't tell, I'm kind of got some stuff in my throat going on. So I'm going to have a Smith and Wesson MP9 M2.0 plus two magazines on my hip. I'm also going to be carrying a Smith and Wesson nine millimeter shield with two extra magazines on my ankle. Uh, I'm probably going to be carrying an Ontario Rat 1 folding knife, which is what I carry now. I'm probably going to have a SOG boot knife. And I am probably also going to be having a collapsible baton. A Leatherman Wave. It also has a file on it, which is nice. Um, Bic lighter, a Fresnel lens, a half inch by four inch ferro rod, tube of chapstick, an Olight M1 striker, cell phone, rat's tourniquet, a trauma kit and first aid kit and a bulletproof vest. Okay. So again, if you want to look at the whole explanation of all that, I did another video on it. I'll try to link below uh, later on. 
That is the EDC level two. Okay. The next assumption here is, is that the environment is a moderate temperate climate with heavily wooded areas. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, so the self-defense, your first aid, fire starting, food and water are covered in your basic assumptions. All right. Hey, what's going on, Bill? And we got Huppel's cat in here too. Um, all right. So when, when thinking about this further, I came to the conclusion that there are basically, I'm going to go with three general types of scenarios. <clears throat> First, we're going to talk about the bushcraft and wilderness survival expert. Someone who can live long term going into the woods with the intention of disappearing forever. Now, it's not real super realistic when we really break that down because forever is a long time. And most people, it's only going to be a few months at a time. But you get the point. Somebody who's highly skilled in bushcraft and, and, and wilderness and primitive living. Um, and, and that person is going to go so far into the backcountry, back into the mountains, that they don't really need to worry about keeping a low profile. They can burn a fire. They can have a bigger shelter. This is sort of the whole inch bag, I'm never coming home kind of line of thought. That person who's going to try to just really go really remote and, you know, be way back in there and live like Jeremiah Johnson. Okay, that's the first person. So the second person is the refugee scenario. And this is where most people probably fall into this category. Um, they're not a survival expert. They may have some experience camping and hiking and glamping, you know, those kinds of things. But perhaps they live in an urban, you know, or like a suburban area. Um, you had planned on bugging in, but, you know, that was your primary option. But something happened and, and unexpectedly forced you to grab your bug out bag and leave, at least temporarily. Maybe you're just going out of the house long enough until you can formulate a plan to go and take your house back. Maybe, who knows, maybe it's just a temporary situation, like some kind of a chemical gas or something, and then you'll be able to go back in. Hard to say, right? We don't really know what the scenario is here. So then the third situation is, this is the lightweight, high speed, low drag bug out folks who already have their bug out location all ready to go, stocked up. They've got caches along the way, and they just need to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. There are the tactically minded operator with one objective, get to the bug out location. Okay. So that's the three scenarios that we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't just break it down to just, Hey, what are the five things? But the bottom line is, is the five things are different depending on who you are, where you're going, what the situation is. So I'm trying to keep it as general as I can, but my mind just will not let me narrow it down to five. Um, <laughs> it's, it just won't do it. All right. <clears throat> All right. I'm just seeing if I miss anything massive. If you guys have anything like significant that you really want to want to throw in here as a question, um, make sure that you try to put it in all caps or put like at reality survival and prepping. So to highlight it. So I can know to, to stop and read it and ask, answer the question because otherwise I can never keep up with it. Okay. So scenario number one, non-combat long-term wilderness survival guy, highly trained bushcrafter type. The first thing that he is going to want. Ow. Got a hangnail. Ow. Sorry. This is live. <laughs> um, is the, or that I would want if I was in this position, if I was this guy, is the extreme cold weather military sleep system. So this is a four part system that the United States military gets issued. It has a Gore-Tex bivy cover, a thicker outer lining synthetic bag, and then a inner bag that is also synthetic and then a, a stuff sack. And all of that is rated to go down to 50 degrees below zero. And if you have a good insulation bed, that's probably about right because I've slept in it outside in um, negative 20 and I was toasty. I was opening it up. 
So it's it's a very good system. Um, but the thing, the reason why that's the, the number one item is the thing that will kill you the fastest out in the wilderness is losing your core body temperature, no matter what. If you've got a good sleeping bag like that uh, with a good Gore-Tex cover on it and all that kind of stuff, no matter how crappy it gets, you know, at the very worst scenario, crawl up under the, you know, a huge big cedar tree, get it right up next to the, the trunk of it, get in your bag, get all curled up and you're probably going to be fine. Okay. With, with that system. Um, and if you have a shelter and a fire and all that kind of stuff, that's even better. But as a, as a serious survival tool, keeping your core temperature to 98.6, a really good layered sleeping system like that is, is highly important. Okay. <clears throat> so number two is the United States military entrenching tool, an e-tool. Now, a lot of people might not think that an e-tool is very important and, you know, okay, that's cool. But here's the thing. If you're going to build a semi-permanent shelter, which is kind of what this person is thinking about, right? They're in the scenario of I'm going to go out there. I'm going to stay as long as I can. Digging your shelter into the side of a hill or down into the earth or, you know, something along those lines, getting it down in the ground and using the earth's ambient temperature is supremely beneficial. Okay. You can also use the military e-tool or any kind of e-tool, but the military one's a pretty good one. There's a lot of really cheap imitations out there. Um, but you can also use it to cover your roof with sod and sod and moss and dirt and all that kind of stuff, you know, debris from the forest floor and all that kind of jazz. And, and so having a shovel makes doing that much, much easier, much, much easier. Um, it's also good for sanitation and stuff like that. It's also good for uh, digging a water catch basin, um, you know, a place that's going to hold water when it rains and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, there's just tons and tons of bushcraft uses that you can use a shovel for, for, you know, a semi-permanent kind of situation. So I think that is a, a really important one that a lot of people don't necessarily think about. And they think that the, the weight is not worth carrying it. And on a short term, it's, it's not, but on a, in a long-term situation, it definitely is. Okay. Number three for the bushcraft dude is going to be a very large stainless steel pot with lid. So I'm talking about the largest stainless steel pot you can carry. Perhaps that is 20 to 30 quarts. I don't know, but I'm talking about a big stainless steel pot. Maybe you can stick it down inside of the main portion of your backpack or whatever, but <clears throat> you want the biggest pot that you can carry uh, and a lid. And the reason for that is, is for sanitation purposes, um, it sucks trying to take a bath out of a one quart little container. It's terrible. It's, you just can't ever really get clean and it just sucks. Um, so, oh, Ice Age Prepper says the sleep system is only rated when wearing the proper gear as recommended by the military. So I have slept in it. Like I said, I was buck naked at negative 20 degrees. Uh, and it was super hot. I was like literally opening it up. So you may be correct. Um, I always recommend sleeping naked personally. That's just the way I like to sleep out there. Um, especially if you've been out, we're doing work all day in the, um, and you get sweat and perspiration and all that kind of stuff in your clothing. But <clears throat> one of my assumptions was, is that you have the proper clothing for the environment you're going to be in. So that's already pretty much covered in the thing. But um, if you're going to get in your bag with clothing on, you have to make sure that you are dry and your clothing is completely dry. Otherwise you will get cold. Okay. Um, next item here. Number four for the bushcrafter dude is a Hudson Bay two and a quarter pound ax. Um, I like the Hudson Bay design. Um, you can get it really sharp. It's good at chopping. It's good at splitting. It's a good multi-purpose ax. The two and a quarter pound um, head, I forget how long the handle is. I want to say it's like 32 inches or something, but I don't remember. 
Exactly, and that is a good size for a full-grown adult. Um, it's not too heavy, but it's not too light. And you can also strike ferro rod with it. You can, um, you know, process rabbits, you know, small game with it. Um, you could even quarter, you know, bigger animals and stuff like that with it. So you really don't, um, you know, have to, to have a, you know, like a fixed blade knife or anything like that. The Hudson Bay <clears throat> two and a quarter pound axe can do just about everything if you sharpen it up right. Okay, number five on the list is the SAS survival bow and a quiver full of carbon arrows with a mix of broadheads and field tips. It's more than one item, but you get the idea. Um, some sort of a, you know, fairly effective primitive hunting tool that could take down bigger game and can also take down smaller game. And, uh, you know, you, you got plenty of time when you're out there. You can also build traps and all that kind of stuff to supplement that. But, uh, and having a, an arrow, a bow and arrow that you're familiar with and that you can shoot is, uh, a pretty useful tool. It's a pretty useful tool. Um, and, and if you practice at them, you can become quite proficient. And of all the hunting that I've done over the years, uh, pretty much everything in a, in a wooded environment has been within 35 yards, 30 yards, 35 yards, somewhere around in there. And so, you know, you can get very proficient with those bows at that distance and, and it can be pretty effective. Uh, okay. So I did throw in a bonus item here. Um, and that is just because, because, you know, everybody would like to have a firearm, I think. And so for this guy, I would say that a CZ-452 Ultralux uh, in 22 long rifle with five magazines and a thousand rounds of ammo would be supremely um, beneficial. A guy like this, if he's a good shot, he's patient, all that kind of stuff, he could make a thousand rounds of ammo last a long time. And he could get a lot of food with it. Uh, it's not great for self-defense, but this guy is going to be so far out into the woods that he's not really worrying about self-defense so much. And he's also got his EDC level two items, which, you know, if somebody comes in close, he's going to be able to deal with them in that way. So, uh, that is the, the top five items plus the bonus with, you know, for the bushcrafter dude, the guy who's got tons of experience, he can go out there. You know, and, and the idea here is I'm going to explain this just a little bit more is that he's going to he's going to start putting together a semi permanent shelter, um, you know, probably something that, that I would probably there'd probably two things I would start with. I'd, I'd start with a double lean to. So basically just a tent. And that's going to be where I'm going to put uh, find two two. Uh, branches or, or posts with a Y in it. Um, probably have the Y be about five foot from the bottom of the post. I'm going to stick that here and lean that against one tree. And then I'm going to do the same thing against another tree like this. Then I'm going to take a big, you know, like a six or so inch uh, ridge, ridge pole and put across the top of that. Okay. And then, and then I'm going to start stacking poles on each side. And I'm going to do that on each side. I'm going to enclose one end and then I'm going to uh, make an opening kind of like a door on one side on the other on the other end. And that's going to be my permanent shelter. I'm going to take and I'm going to cover that whole thing with forest, the duff from the forest floor, like pine needles and moss and dirt and everything else. And I'm going to cover that over until I can't see any light through. When I get inside, it's completely dark. And I can't see anything through. Um, <clears throat> so then, um, <laughs> then I am going to, uh, you know, put the, the, the campfire and all that kind of other stuff up there around the front and all that jazz, but that's going to be my, my primary shelter and shelters of that nature are very, uh, very, very good at, at retaining heat and, and keeping you dry and all that kind of stuff. They give you plenty of space. They also protect you for the most part from uh, any kind of critters. Uh, if the critters are going to come in, they're probably going to come in through the one end of the door 
and you're probably not going to be sleeping right at that end. Um, so you'd at least hear them coming through. You make your door out of like boughs and stuff like that. You'd hear them kind of messing around and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so that's going to be, that's going to be the, the kind of the formation of the start of the base camp. Okay. And that's going to be um, the first shelter. Now, once that's established, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dig into the side of a hill uh, or I'm going to find an area that I can dig down in and I'm going to essentially try to create like a sunken log cabin. So basically, you know, instead of having the walls all be, um, all be, uh, you know, logs and then up, you know, say five, six feet, you know, seven feet high or whatever, I'm going to try to dig down that far and sink that back into the hill. And then I'm going to take those same logs that I used for my other shelter and I'm going to create a pitched roof for it. And that way I'm using the ambient temperature from the earth to help heat uh, that shelter. So that's just kind of my, my thought there. Yeah, Ice Age Prepper. So I kind of covered that in the beginning. Uh, we're talking about three different scenarios. The first scenario is going to be a guy who's a really good bushcrafter. He's he's bugging out way out into the, the, the backwoods somewhere, you know, up into Canada or the Rocky Mountains or somewhere like that. The second scenario is going to be the combat refugee guy. Um, you know, he's, he's a guy who likes to go camping on the weekends, but he doesn't have a lot of bush experience. He lived in a suburban area and he's just going to have to go find some place to live. He doesn't really have a place to go. He doesn't have a place stocked up and all that kind of stuff. He's just going to do the best he can because he's been temporarily forced from his house. And then the third guy is the guy you're talking about. And that's a guy who already has a bug out location picked out. He's already got it stocked up, ready to go, and he's just going from point A to point B. So we got three scenarios. We already covered the, the number one scenario. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Let me... Sorry, I'm just trying to adjust my windows here so that I can get everything into view. <coughs> okay. So let's talk about the second guy. Second guy is like, you know, majority of people, majority of preppers, majority of folks, everyday Joe. Um, hey, Gary. Um, and, you know, he's he's living in a suburban neighborhood. He spends some time in the woods. He goes camping, but he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. He's got a family, you know, let's say he's got a family, a couple, you know, one or two kids or something like that, a wife. And he's got his bug out bag packed and he's, he's somewhat preparedness minded, but you know, he, he just hasn't had the time to do a lot of training in the woods. So the number one item for this guy is a subdued colored tent. I think that the snug pack ionosphere, if it's one person, is a very good tent or the scorpion three from snug pack and that will fit up to three people if you have another small child you might be able to get four in there but it's going to be tight why do i say a tent is number one a lot of people think that's crazy it's not crazy um, like i said for the other guy uh you have to be able to you have to be able to create a micro environment that will allow you to keep your core body temperature and a tent is actually fairly uh, efficient at doing that, especially for somebody who's on the move, somebody who can't build a big shelter and all that kind of stuff. Maybe the environment's a little bit hostile or something. They want to keep a low profile. A subdued colored tent like that is going to be a pretty good deal. Number two is a zero degree down sleeping bag with a Gore-Tex bivy cover. Uh, the reason I say a down bag instead of a synthetic one like Hey, like I said on the other one, um, is because this person is concerned with weight. They're not going to be able to carry everything that they'd like to carry, and they need to save some weight. And synthetic bags, generally speaking, are going to be a little bit lighter. Uh, they're also very good at keeping you warm, but you have to have a bivy because getting a down bag wet is catastrophic. You can't do that. Um, so that's number two. The third item 
on the list for the average guy is going to be the MSR Mini Works EX water filter and an Nalgene bottle. Um, and if you could find a stainless steel bottle that'll screw to the MSR uh, Mini Works EX filter, that would be even better. Um, but, um, hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Mike just gave me a super chat there. I sure appreciate it. He said, great suggestions uh, for all the northern folks. REICoop.com is having a great sale on Patagonia and North Face clothing, plus much more. That is right, Mike. They are. And if you go to realitysurvival.com, go over to the right-hand sidebar, click on the REI banner, and go to the store. That'll help us out with... Um, That'll help us out with the affiliate links. So that it doesn't cost you guys anything more. Thank you so much for that, Mike. I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> okay. That always surprises me when people do that. I, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So the, the water filter is important. All right. The water filter is a, um, it's just a really good item. You got to have water exposure and hypothermia is going to be the number one killer. Water is going to be the number two killer. Uh, you know, dehydration. So if this person is somebody who's on the move. They may have to be moving from campsite to campsite to campsite. They don't have the ability to really, you know, establish themselves. And so when they come across water, they need to be able to go ahead and fill up. Okay. And, you know, I just put the Nalgene bottle on here because that does screw to the bottom of it. Obviously, like I said in the beginning, this person's going to want to have more than the ability to carry than just one Nalgene bottle. Um, you know, like a hundred ounce camelback or something along those lines. But this is the, the bare basics and being able to get clean water will help you to stay on the move. You know, that's, that's an important thing in this kind of scenario. Okay. Number four is going to be the whisper light universal backpacking stove. And I'm going to include, I might be cheating a little bit here, but I'm going to be, I'm going to include the MSR two pot stainless steel set, which you guys saw me, um, uh, use in that taste test. And that's a two liter and a one and a half liter pot. And I think that's about the smallest stainless steel pot set that you'd want to have. That gives them a backup. They can boil water if they need to. Um, but having the MSR stove is going to allow them to, uh, burn fires with, you know, and have heat, have a heat source to boil water if they needed to, or, you know, if the water filter uh, broke or something, Hey, what's going on? SHTF hunter. Um, and it's going to allow them to cook their food and it, it can also be used as a heat source if needed. The cool thing about the universal backpacking stove from MSR is that it'll burn, um, kerosene. It'll burn white gas. It'll burn unleaded and it'll burn isobutane. So it burns everything. And I will have a review on that coming up very shortly. Pretty kick-ass stove. I've used Whisper Lights <clears throat> for 25 years. Pretty close. Maybe 24 now. Something like that. Um, and they're good stoves, you know. So, you know, you can get different size bottles. You can get the bigger bottle. It just depends. I think this one in this scenario, in a bug out scenario, this kind of a bottle is going to be a better bet for you because you can collect gasoline, you can scavenge, you can, you know, you can do lots of different stuff. So, boom, there's that. Okay. The next thing, number five, is a cutting tool, and that is the British Golok. And I've done a video on this. I think the British Galak for a lot of people is a really good um, is a really good cutting tool. You can cut down, you know, larger items for making shelters and stuff. Uh, you could use it for self defense if you needed to. I like to take and do a Scandi grind on the like the first four inches of the blade, and then a convex on the rest of it. So for the chopping and stuff, you're using the convex, and then for, you know, the, you have the Scandi grind for really fine work for doing feather sticks and all that kind of jazz, if you needed to. So Dennis Dove says, what do you think of the, of the Lifesaver bottle system? Are they worth the money? Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, Dennis, I don't know what that is. Um, I haven't, I haven't seen it. If you want to throw a link to it in the description or in the chat here, I'll try to look at it a little bit later. 
and see if I can give you my opinion, but I'm not, I'm not really familiar with it. Hey, what's going on, Savage Survival? Um, okay, so uh, Savage Survival's got a good channel. If you guys want to go over and check out his stuff, um, he's got uh, got lots of lots of good information on there. Okay, so where are we at here? Uh, oh, and there's Let's Talk About Prepping. Go check out his channel too while I'm at it. He's got a lot of good information too. All right, <clears throat> so the the bonus item for this guy is going to be the PSA AR9 um, pistol or an AR15 pistol with a battle belt and three to four magazines. And I say the reason I say the AR9 is if you're concerned with weight, it's a small little um, you know little pistol. Uh, it's going to give you a little better range than a regular pistol, but it would only be one kind of ammo that you're carrying. Remember, we're carrying the EDC ammo, which is nine millimeter for this cat. And uh, so he would just have to have the one kind of ammo. Um, you know, that's going to let him engage out to probably 100 yards ish, you know, minute of man kind of thing. Um, so it's going to be a fairly decent defensive weapon. Um, but again, you know, he's, he's trying to stay light. He's trying to stay on the move. He's probably not going to want to carry a, a whole ton of stuff. So, um, so that is why I went with that. Okay. Let me just check the uh, chat real quick and then we'll try to move along. All right. I don't think I missed anything. If I did miss one of your guys' questions or something, again, just kind of try to tag me in it at Reality Survival or whatever. Um, that way it'll be highlighted or put it on all caps. Okay. So the last guy here, this is the lightweight, or this is the guy that is the uh, high-speed tactical operator. He's got his bug out location already stocked. He's got caches set up along the way. All he's got to do is go from point A to point B as fast as possible. Night, day, doesn't matter. He's moving. He's getting to the area. You know, that, hey, what's going on, Robert? Um, that is his objective. <coughs> okay. First thing for this guy is going to be Or multi camel app, that's cool. Or an old woodline, you know, a woodland one. And that's only if it's going to rain or something, he's going to toss that bad boy on and keep on moving. Okay. He, his objective is to go. He doesn't want to stop and build a shelter if he doesn't have to. Maybe he's got to stop and get up underneath a tree, you know, and because it just got so bad or something and warm up. And that's why his number two item is going to be a poncho liner or his whoopee. <laughs> this is the, the best piece of military gear ever invented. Bar none. I'm going to go out on a limb and say bar none. It's a great, great piece of, of, of kit. Um, and so that is probably going to be his number two item. Again, keeping himself uh, dry and warm is going to be a priority. He doesn't want to, you know, uh, succumb to exposure. Um, but he's on the move. Number three is a night vision device. Uh, PVS 14. Again, if the crap hits the fan at night, he has to leave his house at night or whatever. He wants to be able to see so that he can get to his location. And a good night vision, um, you know, device is going to be something that's going to help him get to his objective faster because he doesn't have to worry about moving at night. Number four is Caden Micro Pure Water Purification Tablets and a 100 ounce Camelback Bladder. Stop, fills up his bladder, toss in his pills, you know, his, his micro pills or whatever, shakes it up, sticks it in his pack. He waits a determined, you know, amount of time, and then he can just keep drinking on the move. This guy, he's he's thinking about speed. He's thinking about lightweight. He doesn't want to be interfered with. He just wants to go. So that's where that that is going to be. Number five is going to be an Esbit stove and some Esbit fuel tabs. <clears throat> Ideally, he doesn't want to have to stop and cook anything, but if he did, let's say he started getting hypothermic or something along those lines, it was really nasty, bad weather. 
he could start, he could stop, he could use that esbit fuel tabs to warm up some fluids and get it inside of his body to get his body core temperature back up. And then he's going to be moving on again. He could also use the esbit fuel tabs to build a big fire if he was in a really bad situation, like perhaps he fell through a creek that was frozen over or something along those lines and he really needed to get a fire going. Those esbit fuel uh, tabs or hexamine tabs are really good for that kind of thing. Okay. Number six is the bonus item for the high speed load drag guy, and that's going to be a, PS, a PSA KS47 pistol in 762 by 39 millimeter because all Huya high speed tactical operators have to have 7.62 by 39 millimeter. And uh, the chest chest harness with plate carrier and seven magazines because he's going to be ready to destroy whoever comes in front of him no matter what and he doesn't want to have any kind of uh any kind of roadblocks stopping him so that's my items took a long time to explain uh <laughs> 36 minutes to explain my, my top five items so i apologize about that but that is just what it is so what questions do you guys have for me? Let me see. I think I got a couple here. Let me see if I can find them. <clears throat> Gary says, don't have a pistol permit, so what rifle or shotgun? Well, which scenario, Gary? I mean, um, for the first scenario that I gave, you'd, you'd, I'd go with the 22. Like I said, the CZ-452, that's a rifle. You wouldn't need it. For the second scenario, I would probably just go with a just a real basic uh, AR-15 carbine, 16-inch PSA's Freedom Rifle. You can get it for 350 bucks. It's a mil-spec rifle across the board. All the parts are mil-spec. I mean, it's a, it's a good little rifle. Um, I, it, it just is. I don't care what anybody says about it. It's, it's a good little rifle for $350. <clears throat> I mean, the one that I would compare next to it uh, is a... Uh, Smith and Wesson M and P sport two, and you can get those for about $500 off of grab but save the 150 bucks. I mean, you're going to have to put sights on it. Um, cause it doesn't come with, it comes with the a two front post, but then you have to put a back in bus sight on it. But whereas the Smith and Wesson will come with both, you know, but they're both very similar guns in quality. I think, um, as far as shotgun goes, if you want to carry a shotgun, it's not a bad option. It's the only problem with shotguns is, is that you can't carry as much ammo because um, it's heavier and it adds up quick, and you don't have as much distance. Um, but I, I think for the money, the CZ six twelve home defense is a great little option. Uh, I want to say they're around four hundred dollars or something like that. It's essentially, as far as I can tell, it's a Remington eight seventy clone. And they're super smooth. They're way smoother than 870. Um, so really good home defense gun, really good self-defense gun. And you can definitely use it for lots of different hanging applications. You can also get the the 26-inch barrel for it for, I think, $89 or $90 or something like that. And so you can put a 26-inch bar barrel on it if you want to, too. So that would be more like, you know, for the bug out kind of hunting kind of thing, if you wanted. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Huffles Cat uh, says, emergency preparedness, uh, have clothing and sleep stuff. You can wash easily. Lice sucks. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I talked about that in the beginning, that they have all their clothing and, and all those kinds of all those kinds of jazz. So Jacob Rinkus says, at Reality Survival, what do you think of the Ruger, Ruger 1022 takedown? I like the Ruger 1022 takedown. I don't have one yet. I do own three or four Ruger 1022s. Um, good weapon. Per, you know, mostly reliable. I mean, you can shoot them and shoot them and shoot them. Um, you can put the 25 round magazines in there, you know, or you've got the, the ones that'll switch around and have the, the 50, you know, 50 capable. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, the reason I like the 452 Ultralux from CZ USA better than a, a Ruger 1022 is because it's, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's twice as accurate. It's got to be close. It's got like a 26 inch barrel on it. Maybe 28. I can't remember. It's a long, it's a long barrel, but it's a bolt action. So 
for a situation where a person is having to stay out in the woods and try to get every piece of game possible that they can to survive, accuracy is going to be really important. And a bolt action is also very reliable. Um, I have personally, on multiple occasions, taken prairie dogs at 200 yards with open sights with the CZ 452 Ultralux. So it's accurate. I'm not that good of a shooter. Okay. It's, it's an accurate weapon. And that was off of, that was leaning off of a four wheeler. You know what I mean? Off leaning on the, on the steering wheel and, and shooting it. I've done it several times. So, you know, anything within 50 yards. Oh my gosh. Pick which or. you want to shoot super accurate not saying just it's mediocre in its accuracy you know so um shtf hunter says oh robert jeffrey says thoughts on the ar7 <sighs> not a big fan of the ar7 to be honest with you um <clears throat> i like the idea that it has the ability to fold itself into the stock and you can have some extra shells in there and that the stock will float and all those kinds of things. And it's not bad for certain applications. Like if I was going to keep a gun in a boat or, and just, you know, just to have something in case I crashed on an Island somewhere, you know, or something along those lines. And I wanted to have a firearm. Um, the AR seven is fine. And that's what it was designed for. Like it was designed for uh, air crew members, you know, who, who were going to, potentially have to ditch the aircraft in the water or something. And, you know, they just to have a rifle to be able to hunt with and all that kind of stuff. It's just really, it's just really not a super great rifle all the way around, especially the newer ones, the front sight on it's very cheap. Accuracy is super questionable. Um, it's not great. Andrew Faulkner says a Marlin 70 Papoose is much more accurate than 1022 takedown. I agree. And um, I would even say, my my second preferred rifle for a wilderness survival situation would be the Marlin Model 60 with the tube fed, uh, you know, the, the tube underneath it instead of having a magazine. And the reason for that is, is that if you lose a magazine, now you're down to a single shot rifle. Well, you can't lose that tube. So you're always going to have the 17 or 18 shots, um, which is pretty good. And the Marlin Model 60 is one tough tough gun. I, I shot those when I was a kid. <clears throat> it had to have been more than 10,000 rounds before I cleaned it <laughs> because I, when I was a kid, I was young. I didn't I know how to clean a gun. I was always afraid to take the trigger mechanism out and all that kind of stuff. In fact, I got the gun when I was like 14, I think. And I didn't clean it until I was an adult, like five years ago. <laughs> I mean, and that gun still fired reliably and accurate. And I can't even tell you how many rounds I shot through it. I mean, I'm, I'm dead serious. So the Marlin Model 60 is an outstanding gun. Um, it really, really is. And, it, and it's very accurate. And you don't have to worry about losing the magazine or anything. So that's just kind of my, uh, that's just kind of my thoughts on that. And it's also super slim. So if you're going to carry it, like let's say let's say you had the uh your backpack which is this is one that i'm going to be reviewing here very soon is the uh the everly stock gunslinger 2 and if you you know it's got the pouch in here that you can slide your gun into uh a <clears throat> a marlin model 60 would slide into that super duper easy and it would be easy to carry with you and all those kinds of things um Okay, Alcarion says, I'm going to be buying my first pistol this summer. My hands are larger, and most feel uncomfortable. Any recommendations? Yes, I do have a recommendation for you. I would give the CZ, uh, CZ75 or CZ85B a shot. It's a bigger gun. Um and, and the, the receiver on it is a little bigger. Um, you'll probably find it more comfortable. If you're a bigger guy, assuming if your hands are big, your body's probably big too. It is small. 
small enough. It's about the same, so you can you can still carry it concealed. It's not the best for carrying concealed, but you can. Um, so you might give that a shot. Um, I mean, a full frame gun is probably going to be what you're looking for, right? You're probably not going to be looking for a compact. <clears throat> if you are gonna, if you do want, to, if you do want a compact still, try the Smith and Wesson M and P nine M two point zero with the three point six inch barrel and the extended magazine, the extended seventeen round magazine. That gives you a good full grip, and it feels like a full size gun except for the fact that it has a 3.6 inch barrel. So it's, it's a little easier to hold on your body. So you might, you might give that a shot. I don't know. Um, yeah, he says he's six foot eight inches tall. Yeah. So, I mean, a full frame gun is not going to be a problem for you then. Um, trying to think of what else. SP01 shadow from CZ is another pretty big gun based on the CZ 75 frame. Uh, the FNX 45, DB Cooper suggested that. That's probably not a bad shot either. Um, so, yeah, that's what I'd probably try. Okay, so Mike184 says, Thoughts on the 511 Rush 72 versus the Everly Stock Half Track for long-term bug out first guy scenario. <coughs> hmm. I'm I'm not super familiar with what the half track is. I have seen the 511 Rush 72. That's a pretty big bag. I probably I'm probably gonna lean towards the Everly stock only because they're built bulletproof, super heavy duty backpacks, man. I mean, the chances of getting a failure in an Everly stock pack are really, really low. The 511s are built pretty good, pretty good for everyday carry use and stuff. But for hard country, back backcountry use, I'm probably going to lean towards the Everly stock only because I know how good they build their packs. Um, but, yeah, I'd have to look at them. And, and honestly, I'll tell you that I probably would – also consider an external frame pack that you could take the bag off of and use as a pack frame in case you were able to bag any big game. So something to think about there for long-term wilderness kind of survival use. Um, not as comfortable, but a pack frame gives you the ability to carry a lot more heavy loads. Um, it's also good for carrying firewood and stuff like that back and forth to your camp. If you're having to get firewood a little ways away from your camp and stuff, you can pack a bunch on there and then carry it in. Can't really do that. It's so good with a with an internal frame pack, you know. So probably you know something to think about. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Smith and Wesson equal, equals machine per perfection. I agree. I tell you what. For the longest time, I wasn't a big fan of Smith & Wesson. When they brought back their M&P line the second time, I think it's second, maybe it's third, I think it's second, um, they really have started to do their guns right. I mean, I, I carry a shield as my regular EDC for all my missions. I carry the Smith & Wesson M&P in uh, 9 2.0, and I love both those guns. Super comfortable and super reliable. Man, I mean, I don't know that I've had misfires in any, either one of the weapons so far. And I've got more than a thousand rounds through them. So um, let's see here. <clears throat> Gary Zier says, What was the over and under your son shot with the changeable tubes? That would be viable. Yeah, it totally would be. And and you could you could you could probably, you know, replace that with the CZ 452 if you wanted to in that kind of scenario where you're going to be long term. The only problem is, is you're like back in the woods, so you're not going to be scavenging a lot of ammo. So that's kind of a, you have to get into the details of how, how to use those. But that particular gun was the Thunder Ranch uh, HS-12 from Mossberg. Good gun, 
I like that it's portable. I like that it's easily to, it's easy to slide into like a like a tube on a on a pack or something. The only thing I don't like about it is the safety when it's at a downhill angle. If you have to, if you get that gun, you're gonna have to modify that. You got to be careful though, because the safety is there for a reason. It's super easy to point that gun right at your toes because the barrel's so short. So I know why they put it in, but in a rugged terrain. I'd be worried that there's something down below me, especially in the mountains. And I got it at enough of an angle to kick that safety in and then it wouldn't fire. So <clears throat> that'd be the only reason I wouldn't like it. The other gun that I saw recently on uh, Iraq veteran 8888, I thought would be super cool is the, the Chiapa or Chiapa triple threat, the three barrel one, dude, that'd be cool. <laughs> that'd be cool. And because then you get to put different tubes in each one, man. I mean, you could have like, That'd be awesome. I guess, and I really want to get some rifle tubes for that thing. Because then, you, imagine if you could put in a set of rifle tubes for like two, two, three, or three hundred eight, and then have all the pistol calibers and still be able to shoot shotguns. Oh, dude, that'd be so cool. Hey, what's up, Tom? Um, <clears throat> okay. What other questions you guys got? Anything else? If you don't have anything else, then I'll probably wrap it up here pretty quick. We're getting close to an hour. Um, oh, okay. Interesting. So Mike says, I have the, the Rush 72 now, and I can't ruck much more than seven to eight miles with it. Now, why is that, Mike? Is it because your shoulders start to hurt? If that's the case, um, check how you're using your waist strap. Um, a lot of people don't wear a backpack correctly. Okay. And I, I said this in another video not long ago and somebody started to give me crap and say, Oh, you're full of crap. You don't know what you're talking about. Trust me, dude. I've worn a lot of backpacks, <laughs> a lot. And you, if you're wearing a backpack correctly, you should have 60 to 70% of the weight sitting on your hips. Okay. So you really want to look for a pack with a good, with a good thick, hip strap. Okay. And that is so that your hips, you know, like where your hips come out right here, they sit, this, this pack sits above your hips, this strap does. And then you tighten down the front and it holds it in. And then the weight sits on your hips right here. Okay. So it, it pushes up like that and it's holding the weight up off of your shoulders. The problem with a lot of those those bags, like the 511, uh, the Camelback BFM is another one. They don't have really good like waist straps on them a lot of times, and so you can't really get it to hold the weight. And then what happens is the shoulder straps start cutting right into here, and it's terrible. It's it sucks, and um, and it's because you don't have the proper waist strap. So I don't know if that's your problem. I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, <clears throat> okay. Walter Davis says, how do you like uh, surplus Alice packs? I love them. I love them. Honestly. Um, I think that's, I think it's probably the best external frame design that's ever been made. I, I mean, honestly, they're really, really good. And you can get them for 35 to 50 bucks, 60 bucks, something like that. Nowadays, I would go with the large frame. You get three additional pockets, plus you got a lot more space on there. And if you pack that large frame upright, you can put easily 100 pounds on it, which is more than most people will want to carry. Um, yeah, so so Mike, uh, Mike says lower back problems, compression fractures, dirt bike accident. You, you will probably be surprised when you put all the weight on your shoulders, you're compressing your spine more. When you put the weight on your hips, it's taking the weight off of your spine because I have a lot of lower back problems too. And the only way that I can <clears throat> go long distance is by having a good uh, waist strap. Okay, black box. He says, he says, hey, JJ, I bought a hammock style parachute tent, non-viable and sub-zero. I did buy a heavy duty Mylar blanket to counteract the loss of heat. <coughs> Um, you might consider with those, uh, with anytime you're in a hammock in a cold environment, 
you might consider like, I mean, you've got your sleeping bag or whatever, right? Uh, hopefully you have that. Um, but even an extra wool blanket or even a thermo rest, uh, something to put underneath you with some dead air space there to get you up off of that cold nylon because sleeping in, um, sleeping in, uh, sorry. Um, Sleeping in, I got check. The chat gets me distracted, you guys. Um, sleeping in cold environments in a hammock will cause your underside to become very cold. So the, you got the right idea with the thermal blanket, but a thermal rest pack or a thermal rest sleeping pad will probably work better for you. And what you can do is you can take and you can air them up and kind of wedge them under the corners of the hammock and then plop right into it and uh, it'll work out pretty good. Um, so, uh, Alker I own says, when do I usually do our streams? So the prepper trifecta chats, we try to do, we kind of try to announce and they usually air on, um, on Saturdays. I sometimes do like a Wednesday night or just whenever I have time, I don't have anything like super set in stone on when I do it. It's really just a more a matter of, Hey, what's up guns and gear network. Um, it's really more a matter of when I have time. So, you know, it just depends. Hey, if you guys aren't subscribed to Guns and Gear Network, you should go check out his channel as well. He is the one that turned me on to the President CB. Um, as some of you guys who watch regularly know, I've been doing a lot to beef up my communications. Um, and I got the antenna back here. You can see that. Um, and so uh, CB is part of that part of that pace plan, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. And uh, so I'm going to be having some videos. I got a couple of boxes of radios around here that I got. Um, FCC has made some changes recently on what is allowed and what is not allowed to be imported and used in the United States. And so that kind of threw some kinks into, you know, some situations. And so I think that I have a plan that is FCC compliant and that will actually work pretty well. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys as well. Um, Acer Rub Rum. Real families with kids, cousins, gramps, and aunties. What's your question? The second scenario that I addressed as far as bug out bag items does address family kind of situation. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure what your question is. So let me know and I'll try to address it. Um, Scotty says, I still have my medium Alice from the 1980s. I got mine from the 1990s. <laughs> a couple of them. All right. You guys got any other questions? Put them in here because I'm going to wrap this bad boy up. We're coming up right on an hour here real quick. I'm going to go back and see if I missed anything. Uh, da -da -da -da. Thanks for watching, guys. I definitely appreciate it. Thanks again, Mike, for the super chat. That's super, super helpful. Hey, Bumblebee Junction. Bumblebee Junction, he's uh, checking us. <clears throat> he's watching us again. If you guys have not subscribed to him and you want to learn anything about farming and homesteading and all that kind of stuff, you should. He's also reported to be a good long-range shooter, though I don't know if he really is or if he's just talking smack. <laughs> And, oh, yeah, he says, why am I down with bayonets on shotguns? I'm not down with bayonets on shotguns. I think that's gay. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of an inside joke, I guess. Uh, let's see. All right, I think I got them all. If you guys got anything else, put them in quick because I'm going to wrap it up. Mike184 says, what boots do you use? I'm running Danners. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm hesitating here. I, I have two kinds of boots that I primarily wear. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say three kinds of boots. I'm going to talk to you about. So one, love banners. Worn them for years. Um, good boots. For a long time, I wore Wolverine boots because they were made well and they were super comfortable. I think the Wolverine boots for the longest time, years ago anyway, were the most comfortable boot on the market and they lasted a good long time. 
I can no longer say that anymore. I can't recommend Wolverines anymore. They're cheap and they are still comfortable, but they don't last more than about a year, year and a half. Uh, Danners are expensive. They're not as comfortable, but they do last and they're good boots. Um, <clears throat> I recently had a pair of Rockies. I've got now they seem to be holding up well. They're somewhat comfortable, but they're not like just real heavy duty. They're more of like an everyday carry kind of boot, whatever. Matterhorns um, are also a good set of boots that I've had in the past. Uh, the other thing, the other second boot that I was going to say, I don't mean to flip you off, <laughs> is uh, muck boots. Muck boots are awesome for for wearing in the woods, man. Especially if it's in the springtime or in the summer, where or the the fall when it's slushy and cold and and all that kind of stuff. They've got two different kinds of muck boots. You've got the the regular muck boot, which is good down to like. Bow hunting, sitting in a stand, I could sit in a, in a stand for about four hours with a pair of wool socks for a regular set of muck boots, and they're they're awesome boots. Easy to get on and off. They feel good. You can walk for miles in them. They're still comfortable. They fit well. Love muck boots. Um, then they've got the Arctic Pro muck boot, and you can go. We can wear those things down into the zero degree range, and still be comfortable with a set of wool socks. Uh, same quality. They're just a little bit heavier, a little bit more insulation, a little thicker. Very good boot also. Um, and then for super cold, like when it's crazy cold, like blizzard, snowpocalypse, like holy cow, it's really cold, is sorrels. Um, I have a set of sorrels with the felt liner in them and stuff. And you can go down to, I mean, till hell freezes over in those things. And your feet are still going to be toasty. So... Um, <clears throat> those are primarily the, you know, the ones that I like, I'd say, uh, it's just, just my thought. Oh, Bumblebee still got time for his uh, giveaway. He's given away $200 worth of lodge cast iron. I'm sure he'll throw the link in here for us all to check that out here in a minute. Um, yeah, his channel has been growing a lot too. He's getting big. He's big time, big time now. He's up over 10,000 subscribers. Um, okay, Jake R. says, How many arrows can a person typically carry of compound metal arrows versus 22 long rifle rounds? So I would go with carbon fiber instead of metal, personally. That's just me. Um, carbon fiber is a lot tougher, I think. Some people may disagree with me, um, but you know, I would say two dozen, two dozen carbon arrows is probably going to be similar in weight to 500 ish, 22 long rifles, but you're going to be able in, in a lot of situations, those 24 arrows are going to last a long time. Now, if you lose lose them, that's going to be problematic. But you, if you're stuck out in the woods, middle of nowhere, you got nothing but time. You can look for your arrows for a long time. So I think you could make two dozen carbon fiber arrows last you a long time. Here's the other reason. I didn't mention this earlier. I should have. Um, <clears throat> the reason I chose the SAS Survival Bow was for two reasons. One, it has the shooting shelf built into it. Um, so you, you don't have a rest or anything that you have to worry about falling off or any of that kind of stuff. Um, the second thing is because it's only 55 pounds, 50 to 55 pounds. And so you can still actually craft handmade arrows to shoot out of that bow. Whereas had I chosen to take like a PSE or a modern bow with a higher test draw strength and all that kind of stuff, you'll shatter those traditional kinds of handmade kind of arrows. They're just not going to shoot them well. You're going to end up breaking the ends and all that kind of stuff. And it's going to be problematic. Um, but with a lighter bow that doesn't have that, that immediate, you know, really hard thrust, you can still make arrows. Um, if you, as long as you know how to do it, you know, so that is uh, the reason I chose that. Okay. There's the giveaway video link. Um, Jake R. Yeah, exactly. Probably hurt your face too. Oh yeah. If it shattered <laughs> in your face, it would hurt if that's what you're talking about. The arrows. 
All right, my drink's getting low, so I'm going to have to um, wrap this up. Shit hit the fan hunter says, JJ, did you see the Grail water filter? Looked like a good idea if you don't have time to boil water. You know, I've heard lots of people talk about the Grail filter. I haven't seen it myself. I haven't had, I've, had, I've seen it online, but I haven't had the chance to put my hands on it and check it out. Um, I don't, so I, don't, I can't really comment on the quality of it. I will question any, any filter company. I don't care who they are. If they claim to be able to filter out viruses, I am immediately suspect because viruses get down to 0. 0.0004 microns. They get very, very small, very, very small. Now they do attach themselves to biological matter and all this other kind of stuff. But <clears throat> to claim that you can filter viruses is a spurious claim at best. And what they're usually doing is they're, they're basically saying that they're filtering out most of the viruses that appear in the open groundwater in the United States, which is very few viruses in all actuality. So, um, and I think the grail is one of the companies that say they can filter viruses. I just, it's just a physics thing. The size is what matters when it comes to viruses and all that kind of stuff. So I'm a little skeptical of some of those claims, but I don't know for sure if that's, that's the one. Okay. All right, guys, uh, I'm out of here. As always, I definitely appreciate it when you click thumbs up button, when you share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter, and please go to realitysurvival.com, sign up for our email list. I'm trying to be more active, putting up posts more often. And over on the right-hand sidebar of our site, you will see our affiliate companies. And we're talking about companies like Sportsman's Guide, Cabela's, uh, Optics Planet, uh, Palmetto State Armory, um, uh, food companies like Emergency Essentials, Augustine Farms, Mountain House. Um, there's just, you know, tons of different companies over there that I've gotten signed up with. And if you click on those links to go to their site, it won't cost you anything additional and it'll help support the channel. So we really, really appreciate it when you guys do that. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next time. I think we're going to have the Prepper Trifecta chat. I didn't look at my email. I think it's next Sunday. Not tomorrow. I think it's the next Sunday. If not, I'll put out a, uh, I'll put out a message on social media and stuff so you guys can see that. So, Anyway, guys, thanks a bunch for watching. Talk to you later.